morning. Uh, we will uh, record this meeting. So uh, if you don't wish to appear in the video, you can keep your video uh, turned off. But uh, if you want to remain, you should sort of accept the, uh, this pop-up window that, uh, that appears. Um, so again, welcome to the ITRL breakfast webinar. And uh, today we will uh, talk about control towers for automated vehicles. Uh, we have a nice uh, setup of speakers. So we will first be given an introduction by uh, Elisa that uh, works at ITRL as a research engineer. Uh, and then we will have five panel discussions or panel presentations uh, from our industrial and uh, public sector partners in our project. So the starting point of this uh, breakfast webinar is a project that we have been running uh, with funding from Drive Sweden. Uh, but Elisa will mention a little bit about this uh, background project. So not to delay things too much, uh, I wish to go directly into uh, Elisa's presentation and uh, let you present. Yes, so I'll share my screen. Yes, here it is. Yeah, so thank you for the introduction. I'm a research engineer at ITRL and I've been working in the automated traffic control tower project. Uh, this is a Drive Sweden project and here you can see all the partners um, of the project. So, Autonomous vehicles are still in need of some sort of human intervention in order to accomplish their mission in a safe and efficient way. And here is where control towers comes into play. So we have defined control tower, uh, a vehicle control tower uh, as a collection of off vehicle services, semi-supervised by a human operator. And uh, the operational phase of a control tower can have different levels of automation. And this is similar to the level of automation of autonomous vehicles. In some scenarios, uh, human intervention might be needed. So the operator might need to take over the vehicles. In other uh, scenarios, uh, the automated uh, response of the control tower uh, can be proposed to a human operator and they need to approve or not approve this suggestion. In other cases, the fully automated control tower response will be enough. Uh, I will present a simple ecosystem of control towers now that we designed in the project. So if we start from the fleet owner control tower, this is the tower that we um, identified as the closest to the vehicles or to the fleet of vehicles. Uh, so this is the one where the operator can actually take over and uh, send or receive sensor information from the vehicles and uh, uh, send other kinds of uh, planning to the vehicles. Moreover, we can add a road traffic control tower. Uh, this is uh, the one that we uh, identified as the public sector control tower and it can send uh, traffic, uh, road traffic updates to the fleet owner control towers or other kinds of information related to uh, the city, for example, or uh, for example, dynamic speed regulations. Finally, um, we have the confined area control tower. Uh, this is in charge of a confined area or an app. And, uh, when the vehicles approach this area, they might need some sort of support, uh, for example, for loading goods or unloading goods. Moreover, uh, this is the towers that provide a set of rules and protocols uh, for the vehicles to follow while in this uh, confined area. Moreover, we can have external services, for example, weather service or logistics service. So, as we've seen from this uh, simple example, we, we need a collaboration between uh, public sector and uh, private sector control towers in order, uh, for, in order to have uh, an ecosystem uh, that works well with autonomous vehicles. Moreover, we identified 
a series of uh, uh, services for each tower I mentioned previously. So now we'll just uh, mention a few of them just to have an idea. So for example, uh, for the road traffic control tower, this can work as an information source for the other towers, but also have some management roles uh, in the city and the roads. Moreover, uh, for the fleet owner control tower, here you can have a direct driving uh, or like remote driving of the vehicles uh, and fleet management. For the confined area, uh, there could be some sort of support uh, to the vehicles in that hub or area, and then defining set of rules and protocol that needs to be followed in that areas. And this is similar to the road traffic control tower, but it's a smaller scale. Moreover, external services, we have like weather or logistic planning. And um, yeah, so to conclude, collaborating control towers would make autonomous vehicles safer and more efficient. And with this, I just hand over to the actual panel discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elisa. And I, uh, before we continue here, if, if you want to ask questions, I suggest that you uh, write uh, your questions in the chat. Uh, I guess we can uh, uh, unmute people if they want to ask questions as well. Uh, that would not be a problem. Then you can raise your your hand. But if you if you want to write, I, I can also read your uh, read your questions. Um, and uh, so uh, before we continue, uh, uh, Elisa, you mentioned a lot of different uh, control towers here in this uh, this ecosystem. Do, uh, will we require all these towers to exist, uh, or or uh, could there be sort of the, the what, what is the minimum requirement uh, of, of control towers in your opinion? So I think. Uh, like for sure they will need like a tower that would be closer to the vehicle that with when the operator could actually take over uh, the vehicle itself. Uh, and then I think there will be some sort of public entities as well, like a public tower uh, that could provide some sort of information on the city or on the environment where the vehicles are navigating. And I think there will be many more than that, but I think that would be the uh, basic uh, or the more simple ecosystem that could be. Mm, yeah, okay. And we'll see if we can shed some more light on, on this during the, the next presentations. Uh, uh, that there will also be, hopefully, uh, a little bit longer Q&A session after the, the presentations. Uh, so uh, we will probably have time for one or two questions between the, the talks. And then, then we have a bit more time in the end, uh, hopefully at least. Uh, but now we will go into uh, so uh, these master slides. Will they be put up in between or or not? Uh, okay, let's. Yeah, I can, uh, I can do that. I can put up the agenda. Yeah. Oh, sorry, not the right one. <laughs> <laughs> Just a second. There we go. Yes, here we go. And now we will uh, listen to Johan Holmquist from Carmenta about situational awareness. Thank you, Johan. So, uh, let's start and see here if I can share the screen. And, uh, look all right. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes, yes. excellent. Okay, good morning everyone and a great uh, start of the morning. Uh, talking to you all, I'm Johan Holmquist um, uh, and I'm from Carmenta Automotive and uh, me and colleagues have had the pleasure, uh, having the pleasure actually to be on board the EVTCT2 project. And our expertise in, in Carmenta is in the field of uh, software for situation awareness and command and control system and by that our role in the project has been to provide knowledge and uh, situation awareness software for the control tower and today I will talk to you a bit about the role of situation awareness in the control tower so let's get started here. 
Um, first, uh, two definitions actually. One of uh, why do we need vehicle control towers uh, important to understand, and the other one is uh, what is situation awareness from this perspective. Uh, but I think there are three major reasons for uh, control towers. They're legal, economical, and technical. And uh, the economical reason is uh, obvious, I think, where um, the transporter companies would like to take out the, the driver of the vehicle to reduce costs. And uh, of course, a very compelling um, scenario here is to have one driver taking care of several vehicles from a control tower. Uh, but uh, looking at that from a legal standpoint, um, the, the, the basic thesis of uh, the Vienna Convention, which is actually regulating most of road traffic, is that every vehicle needs a driver. And um, uh, this fundamental uh, concept of a driver uh, taking care of the vehicle does though not say that the, the driver needs to be in the vehicle or that the driver only can take care of one vehicle. So that would be sort of the legal uh, workspace to, uh, to have a control tower. Nevertheless, the law requires responsibility of someone being the one responsible for the actual driving. And then from a te te technical standpoint, I mean, autonomous vehicles have shown that some of the potentials of enhancing road capacity, improve road safety, increase transport efficiency, decrease traffic congestions, fuel consumptions, and so on. But uh, despite these promising advantages, it's unlikely that the autonomous driving system are going to be able to deal with uh, with all driving conditions at all times. So they need someone to be um, watching over the vehicles and uh, taking care of any situation. It won't be able to take care of it itself. Uh, so that was the first definition. Second one is uh, uh, situation awareness for control tower. Situation awareness for us is uh, the full understanding of the surrounding environment over time. And that means that uh, you need to be in control of what has happened, what is happening, and what will or what might happen. And with this knowledge, you will be able to take wise decisions. And uh, situation awareness will be fundamental for safe and efficient decision-making as well as operations in the control tower. So with that background, um, uh, let's look into situation awareness uh, a bit more in, uh, in detail. We here see a, a man out uh, fishing, and as you can see, uh, he has a very poor local situation and awareness. Otherwise, he had not been near this shark. Uh, but uh, more to it is that he has a very poor overall situation awareness, because if he had known that there were shark, shark warning out this day for the area he's fishing, he might not have gone fishing at all. So with that, we see that uh, situation awareness can be local and it can be sort of a global. And um, Looking at an autonomous vehicle, uh, uh, like we see here on the picture, we see that they have an impressive set of sensors to obtain local situation awareness. And the local situation awareness is a very good, it gives a very good picture to the, to the vehicle of the world up to maybe 300 meters. And um, this situation awareness is of course crucial for, the, uh, for autonomous vehicle operations where the vehicle needs to react to anything near to the vehicle. But this situation awareness gives a, a, a very short time frame to actually uh, react if, if something like that would happen. So um, um, here we see to the left what actually autonomous vehicle see with its local sensors and uh, that it actually can determine what it see and by that determine uh, a suitable uh, action. But uh, the question is how about the greater situation awareness? That is something that the actual the, the vehicle does not have. And if we look to the picture to the right here, we show the complex traffic situation through which an autonomous vehicle will travel. And uh, if you had this knowledge, you would be able to take wise decisions on route, time, efficiency, and maybe most important, safety of your drive. This is the kind of situation awareness that the control tower would need to fulfill its driver obligations as well as the local situation awareness, if, for instance, going into remote driving mode. So how does the control tower then obtain situation awareness? Well, it obtains situation awareness by um, connecting to a, a number of data sources, static and um, dynamic data sources, and combining those into a common operational picture or the system uh, being connected to the vehicle, as well as displaying it to the operator in the tower. And uh, of course, the tower itself has uh, 
direct contact with the, the vehicles it's supervising or the fleet is supervising, getting uh, positions and status of the actual traffic uh, and status of the vehicles and so on. And in return, when needed, if the autonomous uh, driving uh, needs, it can give uh, instructions on how the vehicle should act in one or another way. And all of this, of course, uh, as you understand, um, um, stress the need for, uh, for situation and awareness. Uh, in the project, we um, to, to really study the situation awareness needs, we broke down the tasks of a, of a tower into three uh, different uh, phases, which we call plan, operate and evaluate, where plan is the first phase where you actually plan your route, your goods handling, your fleet logistics, and the result of the plan phase of the tower tasks is uh, a route uh, that should be driven with a certain vehicle, and this is left over to the operate um, uh, task of the tower where you actually start the drive and you start the supervising the, the drive uh, as well as follow the vehicles uh, from a system perspective but also from an operator perspective and giving alerts if something is outside the normal uh, operations but also you should be able to be given uh, support to do different actions to the vehicles out driving. Um, Finally, we have broken out uh, in the operate phase, the remote control, which is a very special uh, area of how to actually uh, remotely operate a vehicle, vehicle out in the traffic. Uh, as you can see, all of these phases needs uh, situation awareness and it needs situational awareness in the different stages of time. What has happened, what is happening and what will happen. And finally, we have an evaluate phase where we uh, record and uh, all of the operation and all the actions taken to be able to learn from it and do the next uh, operation uh, even uh, better. Now, uh, one further layer then of situation awareness, uh, we uh, actually uh, took it uh, down to examining the different uh, subtasks of the uh, control tower and uh, connect, connected them with uh, operator modes of the operator in the tower. Uh, um, the operator modes is uh, here uh, a scale going from just supervising the system and the system working itself up to a high alert where the operator actually needs to go in and uh, act, uh, maybe remote control or at least give advice to uh, the vehicle of driving. And again, we see that uh, it's very important uh, to present the situation awareness both to the, to the system and to the operator uh, to be able to uh, do the tasks as efficient as possible. So every situation needs uh, its own situational awareness um, uh, understanding. And finally, just to connect here to uh, Lisa's um, uh, starting here, uh, we studied uh, what the, the network of control towers exchanging information. Um, uh, and uh, it, it is a big possibility that the fleet operator tower will need to be connected to other towers to receive and send information. And the cooperation between the tower is uh, actually demonstrated in our uh, autonomous vehicle traffic control tower to demo video, which I all urge you to see if you haven't seen it yet, demonstrating this. And um, it was clear here looking at situation awareness from different standpoints that is very important that uh, to take uh, in aspects like uh, uh, time, location, system, terminology, and responsibility, authorization, and when doing this kind of data exchange, but it gives uh, great advantages uh, to the actual operation of the autonomous vehicles. So finally, I would just uh, sum up this uh, in a small conclusion, and um, from, from our standpoint here in the, in the project, autonomous system for uh, automotive applications involving remote human operators or drivers will rely on situation awareness, to effectively oversee and interact with the vehicles. And um, secondly, uh, the lower the situation awareness of remote human operators, drivers are, the less likely that it is that they will be able to take over manual control when actually needed. And thirdly, reliability and robustness of autonomous vehicles control tower concept involving human drivers will rely on extensive situation awareness in all stages of planning and operating. This is very uh, important, of course. And, and then finally, cooperative control towers mean coordinated situation awareness, uh, which would be a, a fantastic thing in the world of autonomous vehicles. 
So I hope I kept within my uh, 10 minutes, Jonas. Yeah, we are, uh, we are we are good on time. Uh, and uh, thank you, Johan, for your presentation. We have time for one uh, quick question, if there is one from the audience. Otherwise, I, I, I can ask you uh, one thing. Uh, you mentioned this in the context of automated vehicles. But many things that you mentioned also could be useful for uh, uh, vehicles with the human drivers, in particular on the on the higher levels that, that will uh, help for uh, uptime or uh, efficiency and uh, so on. So uh, uh, will we have control towers also if, if we don't have automated vehicles? Um, I would say yes, as you as you say, there is a big advantage to have this kind of information to any any vehicle actually connected vehicle at least where you can connect to the vehicle uh, system um, uh, absolutely you are, are are you working uh, mainly in, in, in for automated vehicles or or do uh, do, you, do you think about this also for uh, for regular vehicles no actually why this uh, this presentation was of course geared toward autonomous vehicles as that was the project but uh, from a Clementa standpoint we we work very hard on uh, on both connected and autonomous vehicles and 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 this is important because we see that uh, going towards autonomous vehicles is an evolutionary process and uh, we're already in a quite advanced uh, connected stage where this kind of uh, uh, functionality or support would be uh, just as uh, interesting as for a fully automated vehicle. Yeah, and uh, there was one, let me see what time. Uh, actually, let's save the other question to, uh, to later. Um, uh, we need to go on, I realize, uh, not to lose our timeline here. So thank you very much, Johan. We'll get back to you later. And uh, now I would instead like to introduce uh, Per Olof Svensk from uh, Trafikverket uh, to talk about the role of the public sector in this. Thank you very much. I will share my screen. Yeah. yeah, can you see my screen now? Yes. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, my name is Per Olof Svensk. I come from the Swedish Transport Administration and uh, I work at the Traffic Management Department. I, and I have a responsibility for the long term uh, uh, development of, of road traffic management here. And I will talk a little bit of, of regarding traffic management in the era of connected and more automated vehicles and fleets, which we need to prepare for at the Transport Administration. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about some general considerations we have uh, come concluded in this area and uh, what kind of areas we need to develop for the future as we see it. We have also used an, a, a picture of the ecosystem for digitalization of the transport system for a while, and I will show you that one. And I finally, I will come to, to what is most uh, relevant for this, uh, in this context, the, the rules, actors, and data flows supporting an AV fleet, as this project is uh, handing exactly this. Regarding these general considerations, um, uh, as we see more and more connected vehicles, of course, that's uh, something we will benefit from. And uh, we can, if we can get more data from the vehicles, we think we can have a more, more better view of the traffic situations. Of course, there will be uh, challenges regarding uh, connected vehicles as well, but it is really an opportunity. Um, uh, we also see that we need to manage the traffic more in the future in order to optimize the use of the existing road infrastructure more. We don't have the possibility to build more roads. We need to use them, the existing roads more efficiently. At, same, at the same time, it is already the fact that 
the most of the travelers and vehicles get their traffic information from from uh, in vehicle systems as navigation systems and for mobile phone applications it's not our our uh, direct provision is from the service providers uh, but we also have uh, one very important uh, opinion from our side is that we see that the vehicle manufacturers, the fleet owners and the service providers, they will be responsible for how to use the data in the vehicles and how to develop and impl implement the solutions in the vehicles. We will not, we cannot take that responsibility. We will provide our data and restrictions and so on. But, but when it comes to implement advanced driver assistance systems and automation, it's these the these uh, fleet owners and so on that will implement the solutions here uh, but we need to collaborate between the public and private sector it's more and more important to to reach our goals here of course there's other issues in this context as sustainable business models regulations supporting digitalization uh, so cyber security and integra integrity issues etc but uh, this is some considerations we have come to concluded. Uh, when it comes to areas to develop, uh, priority number one might be uh, to, to assure the quality in the data and information we provide. But we also need, as I said, collaborate uh, more with uh, both with the other uh, road owners at the municipalities, but of course with external actors as service providers. We also need to develop our, our decision support a bit more to be, a, be able to have a more proactive traffic management and uh, use the data and this decision support and implement short-term prediction of the traffic and in the long run AI-based solutions. We see geofencing, dynamic geofencing as a, uh, as a very relevant tool for the future for traffic uh, control and traffic management and how to, it actually uh, uh, is a, a lot about providing uh, dynamic restrictions, uh, dynamic regulations to the vehicles via the uh, other fleet owners and so on. Of course, there also will be multimodal uh, traffic management issues and uh, also uh, traffic management and supporting uh, automated vehicles and fleets, which is exactly what we have been working with in this project. This is a picture we have used for a while now. Uh, it is, uh, we have established this uh, platform, the Digital Infrastructure for Information Exchange quite recently. And this is, is a way to get data from the outside in a secure way in, into our, uh, for, for example, for the traffic management purposes and maintenance purposes. And, but it, it is also a way to, to provide data in a secure way, in a more harmonized way to external actors. And we will not be the one uh, aggregating data from both the private sector and public sector. I think that will be for we be uh, private stakeholders taking that role and and establish services to the to the travelers and vehicles here. So this is a way to show uh, this ecosystem and, uh, and and understand the collaboration that will be needed for the future as well. Uh, Finally, I will come to this uh, this picture a little bit, showing a little bit this what has been work we have been working with in in this project. Um, we can see this traffic control tower, the oper the fleet operator's traffic control tower here, and and uh, the road operator, which will is the traffic variety in this case. And of course, it's this this uh, collaboration we have been looking at in this project and uh, for the future it's really important to to understand who will take which role in the real future operations so that's something we have we will look more into for the future and also of course standards and interfaces interfaces to use in this context uh, as an, as i said before we will focus quite a lot on, on the quali quality in static road data and traffic regulation and how to provide them from our side to the traffic control tower here and also this dynamic regulation geofencing how to provide them from from our side 
via the traffic control tower and, and the, the mobile network operator to the vehicles and how to put specific requirements on this data stream and maybe we can establish level of service agreements all the way from the route operator down to, to the uh, via the traffic control tower and the, and the mobile network operator um, and uh, uh, so that's of a very uh, of large interest to, to work further on this. Uh, we also provide data to service providers, as I said before, and that's one, another way of providing uh, data, uh, traffic information to, to the fleet operators control tower. Uh, and of course, we can see uh, need to get feedback from the vehicles back to from and to to the traffic control tower and back to to us and understand uh, how the traffic is working there maybe there will be also some uh, specific requests from the traffic control tower to the to our traffic management center on on, on specific issues that we need to take care of there so we will uh, this is areas to further develop i think thank you uh, this is what i intended to to present to you today. Thank you. Back to you, Nas. Yeah, thank you, Phil. Uh, very interesting. Uh, so, uh, are there any questions in the audience? Um, I, I, I'm wondering, uh, Phil, the, how, how much uh, investment uh, are, are we talking about here? What is required? We, we hear a lot about um, uh, massive costs, for example, for high-speed trains. Or, or is this in the same uh, range <laughs> in public, public, well, it, uh, it, public it, investments? We, that's something we are discussing a lot. And, and but as I can say, from from our side, in in for the traffic management part, it might not be that extremely large investments needed but there is a lot of costs investments related to 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 communication and and other parts here that we might be part of for the future as well so it depends on how you how you identify what we will invest in and what we 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 can yeah how, how to how to collaborate also but i think we are quite prepared at the traffic management centers to 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 uh, be able to provide what we what we should in this context, as we see it at least. But there is other other parts that might be large investments there. I cannot say specific figures <laughs> for the moment. I don't yeah. know. If it's was oh. a <laughs> valid answer, but yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's right. We, we also have a question here from uh, uh, from Jap Vresvik. Uh, uh, Elisa and Johan hinted towards integration of control towers. Doesn't that imply uh, road operator and control towers uh, fleet integration? And that would then mean that that uh, the road operator has a has an important uh, integration role in this. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what you mean with integration but uh, I, I, I tried to to show how we see our role in this context and, and uh, that we we will of course connect to a number a large number of, of uh, traffic control towers for the future and con and, and uh, provide data to them and irregulations and so on uh, and we will get data back from them uh, i think that's the way we will uh, we will connect to the automated fleets and and, and the, via the control towers for the future. So, so that's kind of a hierarchy for for that. Uh, I I hope I I explained a little bit in the presentation about how our role how we see our role in this context. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, and we hope that we will get back to you also in the end of the uh, session. Uh, but for now, we uh, we go on to the next talk, which is by Christian Grante from uh, Volvo Trucks, or AB Volvo. Uh, so please, Christian. Yeah, let's see. If, can, can, can you hear me? Yes. And let's see if you can see what I have to share as well. Yep. So I'm, um, I, as you said, I'm from AB Volvo. 
but no more from Volvo trucks because we have a new business area called Volvo Autonomous Solution. Uh, it used to be our newest, but Volvo just put up an energy business area as well. So our second youngest business area. And we are working then on autonomous transport uh, systems. So I figured that uh, I will uh, speak a little bit about the drivers, why we are doing this. Uh, and then of course, related to the control tower, um, uh, what we are doing and some challenges. Uh, so the drivers, uh, so as many of you know, Volvo is in the commercial vehicle industry. We are provided assets, machines and uh, trucks. And as you see in, in this, I uh, found a fairly good reference here. You can see that it's actually an underperforming industry that we are in. If you look at construction, here you can see the development in productivity from 1950s, even it actually is worse than it was in 1950s today. And you can then also see transport, the industry, and it's actually being boasted of the warehouses that is also in these numbers because they are starting to use robots and so on. We don't have really high performance uh, in our customer segments. But if you look at our factories, the manufacturing, you can see that that is, um, we have an increase in productivity that is huge. And especially now towards the end here, we can see that with industry 4.0, it's just taking off. So our factories are extremely productive, but our customers' um, systems, solutions, their product, production is not that product, productive today. So of course, this is an opportunity. So, and then I, I think I stole this one from Wikipedia, but this talks about the industry 4.0. So how have our factories become so productive? Well, they are on, its, on their way into industry 4.0, cyber physical systems. So the conclusion is quite easy. We, we need to do the same thing. And although our customers are, our machines are no longer using steam power, but we are still on diesel trying to move into electric. There is a lot of work for us to do and to go into automation. This is a journey we have started, but the real true benefits are in the cyber physical systems, connecting then a process instead of doing a functional, a functional orientated production. Uh, what I mean with this is uh, to use the assets that we today providing um, according to the value flow or the process. So uh, setting up each site so that you can go from, for instance, rock to road, rock to railroad, forest to building with the standardized assets, but with a tailored process. And of course, for this, you need site management. So uh, we speak about control towers uh, and uh, I ten, tend to then speak about site management that for me is sort of the same because we need people in the processes. It's extremely hard to automate everything. It's almost impossible and it's definitely not economically viable. So we, which means that we need to mix people and machine but we get, need to get more effective because of machines. So what do we need from this? Well, definitely we need logistics. This is how to plan, to set, how, how you set up your operation. We need fleet management. This is to optimize the use of the vehicles and machines. Uh, also to optimize, for instance, um, energy efficiency. Uh, and then traffic management. This is to keep uh, control of common resources. The, then making sure that your system, that your SIF is actually safe. Now, it's not like people haven't thought about this before, right? So why is this happening now? And that is because we have enablers coming in, in, into place. We have probably the most important one, connectivity. If you look at our factories, 
all the machines are connected. That's why we are able to go to cyber physical processes instead of using a functional workshop there. And I, I hope to hear more from, I think Stig is coming up after me. So the way that we can connect our vehicles and machine, the mobile machinery is extremely important to make this happen. Then the digitalization is important. Uh, going from where we provide an asset and it's sort of one size fits all. It's not completely true because you can get them in some different sizes. If you buy machines, they come in yellow um, and you can on the trucks, you can have some different numbers of axes, but it's, it's a standardized product. When we speak about setting up a process, it's going to be tailored, tailored for each site. And then of course, automation is coming, making it possible that then for us to do things like this machine, uh, if you've seen them. Drivers for us are of course say safety. We are Volvo, it's um, zero emissions and uh, increased productivity. When we were speaking about assets, we used to call this zero downtime, but productivity when it comes to process is something else. What it enables us to do is actually then to operate uh, with higher productivity, we can actually downsize as you see we have done here, which uh, helps us with uptime, but it also means that we can electrify. It's really hard for us today to electrify machines that are using huge amount of power on the electric machines. And that has to do with that the, the store, storage is, um, it's not that well developed, not, uh, and you can't store as much energy on a, on a electric machine, uh, especially a big one that use really high peak effects uh, as you can with diesel. So by downsizing and setting up the process that you actually can manage your uh, energy distribution in a smart manner. And then of course, the, the connection, uh, the connectivity. Uh, so what we are changing here is actually going from being just an asset provider where we, most of our customers use these assets uh, for a functional workshop to setting up a, a process. When we then go to process, it's more of a solution system. Well, of course, we need to automate the drive. That is tricky because uh, humans are quite creative when it comes to solving situations, which mean, means that we need to make it fairly uncomplex, which means that we need to change the infrastructure, set up connectivity and so on. Uh, we need to take care of the operation. These systems are harder to run, and especially now when they are emerging, uh, it's hard to then provide someone else with assets to service maintain them. But then we come to mo probably the most important piece, what could be called the control tower, but what is the site management, uh, management, actually setting up a process and running a process. And of course here, you also have payment, Volvo wants to make money on it as well. Um, so going into the challenges. So my colleagues in sales say that we have three different um, areas. And I would say that uh, it comes with difficulty, uh, how difficult it is. So we, we are saying we are in mining corridors, we are in portal logistics and hub to hub that's on roads. Mining quarries are simpler system because they are fairly static. Uh, in some cases, you just transport from A to B back and forth. And we can actually then set up the systems so that we don't have people in them. If you go to port logistics, it's, hard, it's harder. And often we need to use roads where we have mixed traffic on. It's still in control environment. So, here, as we saw in, in Elise's uh, first presentation, we sort of grew from a control tower that is local for the site into a control tower that has more actors and there are more things going on that you need to take care of into what um, 
Stig, uh, oh, sorry, Per Olof and Johan was talking about where we actually try to get out on the road. And I would see this as a, an evolution. What really is holding us back, of course, we need the con connectivity. Without that, we are, or we can't do this. But the boundary condition is really safety. And the more we can balance the safety between the sites, and as I said, for for um, confined areas, we can actually take out the people, and then we have a the environment is safe. But then to balance and see that we can handle some of the functional safety issues on the control tower side, on the site side, and not on the vehicle machine. This is an enabler that can make us move much quicker through the system. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Christian. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, I mean, th this progression that you show here from uh, the, the site management and uh, later on to public roads, uh, in the in the early stages, I, I I believe you could at least imagine that you set up a, a, a OEM uh, internal system or site internal system that you don't need to integrate so much with others. You can pro one provider of the of the entire system. Is that is that how you see the starting point for this? Or? Yeah, it, it's easier to design such a system. That's what we have stored within the confined area. So you, you, you can see these are these pictures are actually from a, a mine that we are running in Norway, trucks and these machines are running up in northern or middle Sweden uh, in, uh, in a quarry there. Uh, so it's easier, but it's not really a good solution, to be honest. We, we need the interoperability because very few of our customers will accept that you have that you're tied in to one uh, one supplier because we are suppliers of these systems. So they they want to be able to then use different kind of assets in their systems. And uh, coming from Volvo, we have a lot of machines and trucks, but we don't supply all kinds of machines that you use. So we need to drive towards interoperability. And of course, when we pop out on the in uh, environments like harbor, like logistic centers and so on uh, and roads, it becomes uh, clear that we need it. But it, it's a good way of starting and maturing the technology as well, to actually run with the system that you have full control over. Mm, yes, I think I agree with that. Okay, thank you. We need to go on in the, in the program. Uh, we'll get back to you later. And uh, now it's time for uh, Pietro Longaro from uh, KTH to give a bit of the human operator perspective, maybe. Yes. Okay, just a second. Uh, all right, do you see my screen? I think you see it, okay, good. Okay, hi everyone, good morning. Thanks a lot for having me here. So my name is Pietro Lungaro. So I'm a research scientist at the Mobile Service Lab at KTH, which now is actually transitioning into Mobile AI Lab. Okay, so today we'll discuss a bit of the human factors and some of the sort of solution that we developed in order to ensure operators to be aware of sort of what is going on with the sort of remote vehicles and what are the challenges associated to bring this information uh, from a remote vehicle to a control tower. Okay, uh, so when I, when I basically describe what I do with the control tower, so people immediately think about sort of aviation control tower. And of course, there are sort of many similarities, but also there are sort of very unique aspects with, the, with sort of with our project. In particular, so there is no human driver at the other side, so on the remote vehicle. And also with our system needs to be dimensioned to support uh, remote human takeover in case of emergencies or potential sensor faults. And so as basically you and uh, from Carmenta say, that there are regulatory requirements in many countries and states. And also this will be a critical uh, sort of factor uh, until we basically we reach level five of autonomy, but maybe even beyond. Um, also another important aspect is that we are talking about a mixed traffic scenario where, where we don't have only a single type of vehicles. And also most of the vehicles that are part of the system are not really coordinated or controlled by the same entity. 
Uh, this also means that we have a rate of potential collision with other entities on the road, which is significantly higher than, for example, um, I mean, aviation or other type of control towers. Of course, uh, we have some similarity in the sense that there are sort of two dimensions to the human uh, tasks that, and perspectives. So we have the macro and the micro dimension. So uh, typically with macro, we refer to the possibility of looking at dashboard, bringing a sense of, for example, the entire airport situation or the entire uh, platforms uh, in, a, for example, underground transportation systems. And then typically you have the possibility of, for example, directly calling uh, an airplane and talking to the pilots or maybe talking as well to uh, the conductor of a specific train. And so this is the microscopic sort of perspective. Or in our project and in our sort of control tower vision, also those two perspectives are respected as well. Uh, so we have the possibility uh, from the macro perspective, we want to control the transportation network, which could be bus lines or fleets in general as a rule. And we have a, a global optimization uh, target, let's say that. So we want to optimize sort of network-wide KPIs and bring situation awareness. And, and this is typically quantified or showcase via data analytics and dashboard like visualizations but at the same time we have sort of this microscopic uh, perspective which means which is even more important in the settings so and this refers to the link between individual vehicles and the control tower so this system that we are developing needs uh, to provide a remote understanding of the scene to the human operator but also support uh, potential remote takeovers and driving and in these settings, typically video streaming is considered to be an important uh, characteristic to support human operators in performing these new type of functions. And so my talk is gonna be focusing a bit more on this, on this aspect, on the microscopic aspect. And um, the reason is that we have some severe challenge with streaming in mobile systems. So here I have a short video of showcasing basically what happened. Uh, all of a sudden you are basically streaming high quality, but there is fluctuations uh, that depends on capacity of the system, but also basically and over across the station. And all of a sudden the pedestrian that was there disappears. So how can we basically compensate these and other factors? And so basically this is a struggle the man against nature essentially. And we have bandwidth fluctuation, variation or jitter in the end-to-end -end latency, but also as I showcased before, some cellular and over and intermittent disruptions. So in our, in our side, basically the core design aspect where to try to achieve some reactive solutions that compensate these performance fluctuations. And in the process, basically, we ended up defining a new media type, which combines video with IoT and the artificial intelligence information or machine learning information. Uh, in particular, so the target is that content and C needs to also be easy to understand, uh, which means low complexity or mental workload for the remote operators. So let's take an example of the work we've been doing. So of course, when you have, let's say, full quality, there is very, very little problems. However, when we are looking at a very drastically um, sort of impaired uh, quality, at least for example, due to bandwidth constraints, uh, in our study, basically, uh, humans are starting to be very uncomfortable and starting to lack trust in the system. So our initial thought was basically to provide machine augmentation uh, that were basically computed from the remote vehicle and added as metadata to the frames. So this initially seemed to, uh, uh, to be a good idea, but the problem is the combination of the low quality in the background with all these sort of boxes created immediately uh, sort of uh, an increased mental workload from, from our test, uh, test subject. So the idea was in somehow to start to exp um, expand a bit more the machine intelligence and create a filtering of these boxes that is based on prediction by the remote vehicle about which one of these elements in the scene could be more damage. Of course, this, uh, or so closer to a collision, this improved dramatically performances. However, um, so the human operator has expressed that they wanted to have, uh, um, so to, to see clearly in specific part of the frame, even with the lower bandwidth uh, performances. So what we did, we exploit some of the concepts we developed in another project, which was called phobia streaming. And so this uh, utilized these uh, connected eye trackers and allowed um, the system to optimize the, um, a, a video frame in real time, providing high quality only in a small portion uh, that is in the line of sight of the remote uh, operator. So when the user look, we have high quality, but in the background, we have lower, lower resolution. This allows us to reduce dramatically the bandwidth needed to provide the service, at the same time, delivering high perceived quality. And we have shown in several uh, studies with partners that we can almost save 90% of the bandwidth, or basically increase the, uh, 
the, sort of the, the resolution at the same sort of cost. Uh, so in our system, what we have shown basically that if you have sort of such an impair uh, frame that you receive the operator side, we could in principle uh, augment at the modest increase in cost only a specific uh, area where the operator is looking. And at the same time, providing the support uh, bounding box to understand the, the, the complete scene. Also, uh, the, the system could support the operator by uh, requesting for input in specific parts of the frame or attracting the attention uh, because we know in real time that the operator is missing, has missed, for example, looking at these pedestrians. And so this creates a sort of symbiosis or a cooperation between sort of the human and the machine that is very beneficial and the show increased trust in the, in the system, even with low performances. So I want to briefly show uh, an, an embodiment of this that is working with real time streaming, uh, where basically we show the, the formation in real time of sort of high quality region and low quality background. And this is dynamics and extremely reactive on wherever the operator looks. And of course, the, uh, the size of this basically is adaptive uh, with the available bandwidth. And of course, in this vision now, the operator can look at a specific object in the scene, in the remote scene, and receive a feedback from the vehicle. So the vehicle can tell, yes, I've seen this specific car, or I've seen this pedestrian. It could also draw and over, uh, superimpose the, the, the path that the car is going to follow or the vehicle is going to follow in the next few seconds, and also provide information like the LiDAR distance, LiDAR reading for that specific object. So basically creating an immersive new type of media that combines both AI uh, and video. And so this is some, somehow now the sort of the, the loop or the communication loop where you have an operator at one side and we are exchanging basically and processing information on both sides. But the main thing is that now together uh, with video, we provide task aware AR layer that use uh, machine learning data from the car, but also IoT data together. And uh, now for what concern uh, human intervention, just briefly concluding, uh, we know for a fact that latency could be a major problem. And you see now the type of errors in meters that we can perform when vehicles are running at the given speeds and you have different type of latency in the network. So based on our experiment, we strongly uh, believe that remote driving should be absolutely the last option, unless you are really on a well uh, deployed 5G network. So in many practical network scenarios, the optimal uh, strategy should be that the vehicle will perform all driving tasks autonomously, while the operator uh, will just supervise and provide only a level input, like, for example, overtake, exit. And uh, so we have been developing uh, several interaction modalities, but also tested with specific embodiments. So just to give you a simple example, here I will show a simulated sort of word where I can basically tell uh, this um, self-driving car to basically force basically uh, um, uh, crossing an intersection by pressing a button. And, and this is because with increased latency, uh, it, it is very difficult for the remote driver to control properly the vehicle. And it could be actually uh, risky because uh, there is a, a sort of a substantial gap between when the action are taken at one side and, and when the, uh, the action are performed at the other side. Also, uh, another modality we've been using is, for example, to use eye tracking to provide input uh, um, for selecting different choices, like in this case, which one of the sort of docking spot to go, and where basically so this information is good enough for the vehicle then to complete sort of its own self-parking. Um, so uh, um, we believe that sort of this, this exploration of interaction modality is really crucial to, to understand basically sort of the best option and, uh, and to basically create also adaptive solution for different type of operators and vehicles. And so we have been, uh, we are looking to sort of several modalities, including EMG and eye tracking. And we are ex exploiting also some of the paradigm that we've been developing another sort of parallel project called Mobility X, where we are the developing the world first uh, gates control per mobile. And there we are prototyping a symbiotic human to AI interaction, which is also embody an inclusive design paradigm. Uh, also, it's important, and we will sort of continue uh, uh, extending this testing result with focus on the real drivers, because we want to understand sort of this digital ergonomics and get it right. But also, we want to understand which type of skill set and knowledge will be required for this new type of jobs, and also how this will be scaling uh, uh, in function of the fleet size and the number of tasks. Uh, of course, network performance are also very important. And the idea would be also to assess really how good uh, quality of service policy in 5G will support sort of our streaming solution and to deliver the quality of experience at the end. 
thank you very much for listening and please feel free to contact me also at my email for, for any questions. Okay, thanks, Kato. Uh, small, small, quick question, but maybe. Uh, we talk about uh, supporting the, the vehicle operation from, uh, from off-board, from, from a tower. Then, uh, of course, in the next step, you would also automate the, the, the tower operation, and then you would instead supervise the tower. Uh, so wh what is the best uh, place for the human in, in this system and, and how much can be, uh, can be automated, do you think? I mean, uh, a lot of the interaction can be absolutely automated. Uh, one of the sort of constraints are also what is the regulatory constraint here that we're talking about. Like, for example, I think Yuan at Fermenta sort of br uh, briefly brought out sort of this uh, regulatory constraint. And I think, so in principle, most of the decision are, I mean, should be locally performed by the vehicle. However, I think also in the future, uh, there will be emergent, even when we have a sort of higher level of autonomy, there will be sort of requests from the vehicle about different options. And to do this sort of type of input, I think humans will be significantly longer, more relevant uh, than just for micro sort of driving type of uh, scenarios. Um, and especially also when there will be potential failures in terms of sensors. So even the level five of autonomy is reached, there might be still sensors that are faulty and they might need temporary input from, from the human. So I think a lot of this could be automatized. However, we will need for quite some time, I think, human. And there is also another psychological dimension, which I think plays a critical role, uh, which is similar essentially to why we need pilots in, in the cockpit in an airplane. Uh, apart from performing the task, I mean, most of the basically flying operation could be fully automatized. Uh, however, passengers might not really perceive airplane as safe without somehow human potential intervention. So all of those aspects, I mean, are very, I mean, are very important also beyond the pure and the mere technical solutions. Uh, and, and it would be very interesting to take into account also these these aspects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, thank Pietro. Uh, we need to continue now. Uh, several of you have already mentioned the, the importance of good connectivity for these type of applications. And now we will have Teek Passion from Ericsson uh, to tell us a bit more about that. So please, Teek. So um, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. So we, Ericsson, has been part of this uh, advanced control tower project uh, since the early days. And uh, we, th this was also the project that we first tested 5G outside of our labs then in Chista and in other places around the world. So we have learned a lot fr from this project uh, during the time we have worked with you, your team, uh, Jonas. And then as a result, and we have taken a lot of the results we have done together with you down to Shista from Ballalavägen at KTH. And then we have created a Shista 5G automotive trial site. And why have we done that? Because we see that we are, Ericsson is present in 185 countries. There is a lot of requests and to from uh, different players and, uh, and actors then to understand what can 5G be used for. And one example before the corona is that there is coming 7,000 people, uh, 7,000 customers to our experience center, around 65,000 uh, visitors then when there were no corona. So we need to have a playground where we can show advanced uh, use cases. That was the result of the, some learnings we had in your advanced control uh, tower project. So we have started to build that uh, automotive trial site in Shista, and there is a lot of interest from different ecosystem partners to do trials and tests. So that is the background. So we are, we was, we are happy that we started the, the Earth outside journey with you, Jonas, then to learn a little bit from your advanced control project. Um, so if it takes the next. So what we are trying to do in 20, 2021 then is to demonstrate uh, 5G for teleoperating driving. And here we're taking the learnings we have with the 
with the mini cars that we, the, we together developed and based on the same soft like the Nvidia Jetson. But we also will test a lot of quality service and advanced positioning services. And here then we need, uh, need ecosystem partners that so we can do more relevant uh, use cases. And we start also to see there is a lot of interest then to do a lot more trials uh, out, in, out in the field. A very good example to, to that chat and connect to what Per Olof said from Trafikverket is that we asked a month ago was asked together with Trafikverket, can you do some practical tests like with this North factor in Skellefteå, can we have automotive teleoperating driving then in the industry campus up at Skellefteå, run it over road 372 that is 12 kilometers down to the harbor of, uh, of Skellefteå. And then we see that there is a lot of use cases that needs to be tested. What are the QS mechanisms in a private, private, private confined area? How can we then map that, uh, feed those features then over to the macro, the public network, and then back into industry or a harbor at Skellefteå. So we see that we need to test a lot more the functionality and features than with different type of ecosystem. And I'm hopefully with the learnings we have had from the advanced control tower that we also can have the first demo with some real concept cars that uh, by, by June this year. We will have a Shista Mobility Day on the June 1st, so we hope we can take a lot of the good result and, and map it in. And also KTH is part of this uh, during the first half of 2021. And even then, take the next slide. So I think it's a little bit animation, really. So, so thank you. So what we have learned and, uh, and when we talked about connectivity, connectivity was not so complex as is it now uh, in the 5G. What we have built in Shista is what we call the 5G standalone network that is dedicated. And it, the purpose and it, the reason why it is created is that it will support all the benefits of the 5G, 5G architecture. In the other setup called non-standalone, you have to have a compatibility down to GSM then and so on. Here is we have created a standalone network where we will test the new type of functionality with high speeds and other new functionality. And then one new thing that is also coming with connectivity in the 5G network is that what you can see as the quality service gateway. You know, the IT at enterprise, they have since 2012, 13, started to deploy cloud services. They also have implemented uh, API, man API management. Now the telecommunication networks are out, so they say. So we are creating an API gateway. So if you use uh, API and REST, REST APIs in your traditional IT environment that your enterprise, it's the same here than in the telecommunication network with 5G. So instead of like when we have done quality of service on the modems in 4G and, and so on, we have then manipulated 80 commands similar to when you had the dial up internet in 1995. It's the same on the modems now, but now you can do the interaction on a large, much higher level like using REST APIs. And that was the, what this we are testing then in, in Shista with the different partners. So for instance, that you can request uh, quality service. You saw a very good example of that in Petro's, uh, Petro's uh, research and presentation. And to use that, uh, we are implementing and using some old technology that we developed back in 2012. One thing called WebRTC, Web Real-Time Communication. That is the technology or protocol we are using then to guarantee video communication with, with the car up to the control tower. And here we have also developed uh, uh, con using a control channel then to send all control commands and so on. And then to to do, really do this to control tower, we are also developing an application server then for demo then uh, real control tower uh, the, uh, application server. 
But we also, as you see in the middle of the picture, and are developing a digital twin because we see that uh, this starts to be so complex. So we develop a digital twin so we can then simulate the system and use it as a digital twin parallel when we are running and driving real cars. And that is important for us then because in 5G, there will be a lot more individual uh, radio streams compared to before. Yeah, so there are more beam forming technology that is used in, in 5G and that from that point of view, it will be complex in like high, highly dense areas then. So that, that from that perspective, we need to have, have uh, a digital twin. And our thinking is that we should have the possibility to run like 100 tracks or so in the same digital twin so we can simulate what is happening in a confined area or out on, on public streets. And then uh, we're also developing what we call VR use then, vulnerable road user. As uh, Traffic Verket has an old vision that no people should be killed in an accident. And we're also trying to develop function that can be used by the truck companies and other, and other walkerier or fleet managed companies that they can be informed and warned then when a truck driver then is on its way to hurt or hit the, the road user or a working road worker. So that is also a function. Um, and then to do this, then it, 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 we have to use uh, quality of services. And we use quality of services then to guarantee the bandwidth, bandwidth, bandwidth from the car or the truck driver up to the control tower. But also here then we see that we need to have new type of quality of service mechanism that can, as also pointed out in the research from Pietro, that can guarantee the, the video quality in the stream then. We will use something called Scream that is also an invention in an RFC 8298 from Ericsson. We will use that also to better guarantee the quality of the video stream so we can improve the the research that Pietro is doing in his presentation. And also rate adaption that you can come both from the course as well as from the network through the control tower. Um, and then we are interacting with other third parties too, like we are also working to get positioning data from Lantmetriverket and using RTK GNSS that we will distribute through the 5G radio network. And here we see that uh, we can go to come down at least we have seen in Shista that we can have accuracy of sub 10 centimeters. We have seen three centimeters, but we have done tests in out on the sea then in Westervik where we have a resolution of accuracy of one centimeter. And here also we see like if you take the North Pole case that uh, I'm aiming then to try to show this here that can we do RTSs. LRTK GNSS positioning from an industry campus like in Skellefteå over public roads down to Skellefteå hand to test the, the handovers. That also was a challenge that Peter pointed out on that we want to do then to test. And then we, I'm pretty sure that we will be one of the first in the world that technology wise can do that. And then we're also doing trials then in with this uh, system in, in Gothenburg as well as supporting Christian in that Volvo will test of the Volvo construction equipment in Eskilstuna do that remote from this site. So with that, we can take the next slide. So what I will try to do then uh, during this year and based on results from your projects is that continue then to support different ecosystem partners with uh, helping out on teleoperating driving try to understand and explain the benefits to using 3GPP quality of service. Also implement new functions that, that can better guarantee video quality and so on, so, so people can be more happy with the video. And also the positioning then improve that then both for HOPS internally campus or using HOPS between private confined areas, public streets and, and confined areas. And also see then how we can improve the digital twin with new type of function, functionality. So with that, I thank you. Thank you for 
for, for my time and then thank you also for all positive efforts we have done and created in this project. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, so I, I have one question about uh, the network operators. So uh, when this is deployed uh, along the, the, the roads, 5G along the roads, uh, will, will, will it be uh, several parallel deployments from different operators like there is in the, in the mobile network now? Or, or how do you see that? Yeah, it's in some countries, it looks like there will be uh, a lot more effort to combine the infrastructure and so on. But in some others, um, there will be more competition. But it's also a big effort from the European Commission to, as you uh, have seen, that there is a view that Europe is behind. So the European Commission is also trying to push the mobile operators and the vendors to, to build out more and more 5G networks. Uh, connected to the road infrastructure. It's hard to say, but um, at least we need to work with ecosystem partner because this is so complex. And one of the good learnings we had from your projects was this multi-role uh, approach that uh, Frank and Elisa did a great job on to define. So, so I don't have my, uh, the crystal ball in front of me, but mm -hmm. uh, so I can't give, give an exact, exact answer. So, uh, Magnus here from Telia, can I uh, uh, ship in on this uh, question, perhaps? Um, Absolutely. Uh, so, so, so from from a Telia perspective, I mean, we we are, so to say, very keen to to secure that uh, this type of infrastructure can scale, uh, and that we can reuse the assets and the infrastructure that we build anyway for for. Our, for our, for our, you know, supporting the, the Swedish society with both communication services for different purposes. Uh, and we are monitoring then what is happening in this space uh, and uh, uh, to, to see how we also can be part of building this type of infrastructure. It, is, it will probably require some other business model or some type of new uh, engagement both from EU or from other parties uh, so that this ecosystem can be built on, I believe, important economy, uh, so to say, scaling grounds. Uh, because there ne it needs to be economy in this, of course. Um, uh, so uh, so our, our, our ambition is, of course, to be a part of this ecosystem and ensure that our infrastructure can be used uh, as a multi-purpose infrastructure. Uh, for, for building these uh, transport uh, zones also in, in, in the Swedish market. Um, but uh, uh, I would say that uh, the, 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 the playground, so to say, the field of play here is not really clear how this will come about and who is doing what. And, and uh, the ecosystem in here needs to be figured out, a little, I think, a little bit more before we uh, uh, push this forward uh, uh, rapidly, so to say. No, and that is a very relevant comment. Uh, we are training them, if I, if, if I say training with different, in different projects and to better learn and understand how to, to be part of an of ecosystem in Sweden and then abroad as well. So you need to uh, do practical tests and train. That's the only way to Bet, get, uh, get, I, I fully uh, agree, and, uh, and we engage uh, uh, in, in many of the different projects ongoing now to better understand both the technical requirements and also the use cases, the security measurements, and everything that we talk about here. Uh, to understand yeah. what we actually need to build to build something that is uh, uh, relevant for the use cases that you use the infrastructure going forward. So, but, uh, one positive comment out of Corona, if maybe there are more, but. Uh, as I said in the beginning, that we are present in 185 countries and everything is closed in Chista when it's come, come to Experience Center. We're getting a lot of requests to do remote uh, presentations. So uh, I see that the people that are part of our ecosystem and we are part of other projects uh, can have a good visibility outside of Sweden. That I see as a very positive sign from when we built this Chista site and all the learnings from KTH. So. So it's good for the players that are part of the ecosystem to expand outside of Sweden. Yeah, I mean, I, I would not be surprised if we take a leapfrog 
you know, after Corona and really push forward more digital use, use cases and also this area, uh, I think we'll have more, uh, you know, power behind it uh, as we move forward. Um, we see that trend in many of our customers that they are now looking to take a step in their automation and digitalization uh, uh, investments, so to say. So that is, I think, really positive. Um, Maybe that can link. You also had a question for Trafikverket, Magnus, in, in the chat here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I saw that uh, uh, on one of the slides, uh, Traffic Racket had a uh, infrastructure uh, piece that they would uh, like to build on their own. Now, uh, my question was uh, what the ambition really is uh, for Traffic Racket to build an own and manage infrastructure uh, and where, where the limits are and where the ambition is. So that uh, to that uh, it was a little box. It's easy to do a little box on a slide, but uh, I wonder what, what, what it actually contains. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, we we uh, we uh, when it comes to connectivity and and how to connect to the vehicles. We have the position that we, we rely on, on the fleet owners and so on to, to install and, in, and uh, the application there. So we will not connect directly to the vehicles and not, not, not try to connect to individual vehicles and tell them how to, how to drive and how to perform and so on. But we, of course, there, we rely on the whole ecosystem and the connectivity. So there, uh, and, and we rely on cellular connect, uh, connectivity uh, uh, in the first, at least so far, we haven't, we have no plans for installing short range communications as for now, it might change for the future if we see that it's ne necessary. But for now, we, we, we rely on the cellular communication and it might be that we need to, to put requirements on, on how, on the performance all the way to the vehicles uh, and, and collaborate to, with, with uh, the other uh, stakeholders there. So, so exactly as, as some of you said, the, the, how the roads and the, how who will take which role in, and who will pay for what in this uh, in this um, situation is not uh, defined so far but we have a dialogue with many actors on also on the european level here and how to proceed on on, on this but we will not install we will rely on the, on the cellular connectivity and not not uh, not um, build that much of all of our own connectivity infrastructure so to say I don't know if it, that's some kind yeah, of answer. Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. There is also, of course, a, a dialogue on, on how to build this, uh, how to develop the 5G infrastructure and what's our, what will be our role in that. That's another side of the, of, of the coin, so to say, and, and uh, using the same kind of fibers and the installation uh, uh, alongside the roads and so on. So that's one side. The other side uh, is, is the, the requirement, requirements on, on the performance of the, of the connectivity and how to, to, con, how to uh, collaborate on that. I, I, I do think that uh, uh, over time, um, to, to, to walk from, you know, move from um, research and innovation to scale, uh, we need to have a common view and plan on uh, how this should, uh, what steps to take here, really. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, because if we want to have, uh, and I really like the video here from uh, KTH, that uh, the importance of high quality video uh, uh, can be fundamental uh, or, or not, depending on technology, of course. But uh, if that is a, a requirement with high broadband connectivity, and the quality of service and the volume, it will require massive infrastructures uh, in the end. Yeah, and that's the reason why our focus has been on QS and in our test beds then to help the system partners to, 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 to get the better understanding how to use it. Ah, okay, we are approaching the, the end here. We only have a few more few more minutes. Um, 
but uh, so so maybe uh, we could just have a sort of final remark from uh, from the, the panel members. What you think is the the main challenge uh, ahead of us, or what's the the next step that that uh, that we need to take? What is important to uh, to focus on? So let's uh, um, start with uh, you one. Sure, thank you, Jonas. I think uh, from uh, the next steps for. Uh, automated vehicle towers is to get into uh, to real testing. I think from the two phases that we've done on the AVTCT project, there's a lot of uh, results to uh, to lean on, uh, but uh, the real field testing and, uh, and um, the real uh, getting out uh, uh, on the road with the real material will really start to give us the feedback we need to, to refine and, and uh, really get the system up working. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I agree. Uh, P.O.? Yeah, uh, I think this, what we have been talking about the collaboration and who will take which role in the in future real operations is really something to, to, to work on and, and, uh, and uh, understand for the future. Who will, who will do what and who will invest in what and, and uh, to agree on, 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 the, on the road map for the future. But, that's really important. Thank you. Yes, and um, Christian. Yeah, I see the main challenge as, of course, then getting a connectivity that is so good, so that we can have uh, people in uh, collaboration work with the machines and uh, and vehicle without being on board in them. Because setting up these processes will be uh, uh, then uh, collaborate robotics sort of what with the vehicles and machines and of course that requires connectivity and it requires then integrity in the uh, connectivity yes good point and uh, pietro from you Yes, I mean, basically very similar to Christian, one dimension, so human to AI interactions, basically. Uh, they are critically critical in many sectors and many areas of application, but I think even more even more in this one. Uh, so getting right and uh, understanding really how to design the services, but also as well uh, following a bit on Magnus and Stig also, so the network performances and basically how to optimize uh, for this type of services and what are the achievable performances. Maybe how can we change a bit the content provision paradigm for these services? Yeah, and the final words will uh, words will go to Stig. No, but I think uh, to work in open ec ecosystem and work and help each other because I see that 5G is going faster than other earlier versions, and also we see early signs of 6G, uh, like in the Pietros. Uh, Presentations I work together and test and learn, I think is a key to uh, learn from each other is a key. And I think this has been a good starting point, this project. Yes, I agree fully. Uh, and thank you, uh, all participants. Uh, and also, Elisa, you didn't get the chance to say anything now, but uh, th thank you very much. Uh, and we hope that we will continue uh, our collaboration in this area. Uh, within the consortium and, of course, also with possible other uh, partners. Um, keep your eyes open for future ITRL breakfast webinars, and I hope to see you at those. Yeah. Okay, nice. thank you. Yes, Steve. Thank you.